Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brad Topol, and this is Steve Martinelli. Uh, we have Phil Estes and Jason McGee. Uh, we have a nice session, uh, some hot topics, uh, federated identity and containers. Um, I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer. I lead all of our OpenStack upstream contributions. And I'll let the other speakers introduce themselves when they speak. Oh, hey. I'm, uh, I'm Steve. I'm going to be the Keystone PTL, which is the project team lead during the uh, Metaka release um, for the Keystone project. OK. So our first topic is federated identity. Um, when we talk federated identity, the OpenStack component that is responsible for federated identity is Keystone. Uh, this is OpenStack's authentication and authorization and access management service. It also provides audit capabilities, uh, identity, and service discovery. Supports a lot of token formats uh, and includes new enhancements for things such as federation. And it's used by all the OpenStack uh, services. So identities are you know, what are authenticated uh, by Keystone and OpenStack. And where can these identities come from? Well, the operator can store the identities inside Keystone inside its own little SQL. Um, it doesn't have very good password support. Um, the next step is the identities can come from an enterprise um, LDAP. And uh, that's very common. That's a, a nice way to do things. Um, so that gives you integration with uh, the customer's existing a uh, place for storing identities. But um, Keystone still sees the passwords. The most secure way to do things is through federated identity provider and Keystone's federated identity provider support. Um, this is the most secure approach. Keystone never sees the passwords. It also allows you to do single sign-on and, and these types of capabilities. So Steve's going to take us through uh, more detail on this. Uh, thanks, Brad. So taking a step back, um, federation, if you kind of break it down into the basic terms, it's when two different organizations are trusting each other. Um, and in the Keystone case, what we want to, what we want, um, what we want to see is um, two different entities trusting each other for identity. So in this case, Keystone can have identity providers, and it trusts that the users have authenticated with their identity providers, and they're now able to do things in Keystone. Uh, and single sign-on, if you know, we see this in examples all over the place on the web, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just using your own credentials. So in this example, I'm using my Google credentials to sign in and access another application. So if you think about it, it's just using credentials from one place and, using, and then using an application on, on another place. And uh, most enterprises already have a single sign-on and federated identity solution. So internally, you might be using single sign-on and federation to do things such as book travel, um, assign meeting rooms, things like that, do expense reports. And uh, now a little bit of a history of federated identity in OpenStack. Uh, so why did we want it? Well, we wanted it for the reasons that Brad had mentioned in the, uh, one of the previous slides there. Um, we could store users in the SQL backend or use LDAP, our LDAP plugin, but they're, they're not as secure as a pure federation approach because Keystone is still seeing your passwords in there. And this way, if you create a trust relationship between Keystone and an identity provider, Keystone will never see the password. It's a lot more secure. Um, it's just 
somewhere we, where we want to be. And we started this in the Ice House release. So in the Ice House release, we finally introduced a initial set of APIs that, uh, where you could create identity providers, create protocols, and, uh, and authenticate against Keystone. Uh, in the Juno release, we advanced this into including something called Keystone to Keystone support, which you could exchange identities between different Keystone deployments. And we started to include command line interface support. In Kilo, we uh, worked with the Horizon team to include single sign-on support for OpenStack. And in Liberty, we finally started to see uh, other projects kind of embrace this. So you saw Ansible and Puppet and Chef kind of, and even the OpenStack client command line project started to adopt this as well and take an interest in it. So what is IBM doing for Federation and OpenStack? Well, I've been involved with it ever since the beginning, since the initial first talks started to happen. I've contributed to all of the blueprints that we listed in the previous slide there. Um, and we've collaborated a lot with the different folks, uh, such as Rackspace, Red Hat, CERN, uh, HP. We've collaborated with them to create the APIs and the uh, functionality in the code. And like I said, we've implemented several of the blueprints together. And I like to think that we're seen as leaders in this space. So what can you do with OpenStack now? Uh, you could use it for things such as social logins. So you could actually sign in with your Google credentials if you set it up correctly. And even further, you could actually uh, use a command line support for this as well. And so what else can you do with it? Uh, you could also use it with an existing enterprise identity provider. So something such as Tivoli's uh, I Federated Identity Manager, which is an IBM product, as well as WebSphere Liberty. Um, if you install the correct extensions, it can act as an identity provider, and again, Keystone can interact with those as well. And both of these support single sign-on and access through um, a command line interface as well. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, if there's just one takeaway you could get from this, though, is that Keystone support for federated identity is um, agnostic. It doesn't care what your identity provider is. It just cares if you have it set up correctly. And uh, I think that's the big takeaway there. It, it's pluggable and it's agnostic. And uh, Brad, you want to talk about the future? Sure. Where are we heading? So we have some wonderful offerings. Um, you know, our Cloud Foundry-based offering is IBM Bluemix. Um, you heard about the announcement of Bluebox Local, which is OpenStack-based uh, uh, local cloud. And of course, we have the dedicated cloud. So where we're looking to use Federation is to provide seamless integration for all these these um, different. Uh, offerings that we have so you'll you'll see a lot of work there behind the scenes you may not see it yourself but it'll make things a lot more consumable and uh, now we're gonna hand it off to uh, Phil and Jason to talk about containers I think Jason's gonna kick it off cool right. Thanks. Oop, there you go all right how are you guys it's uh, after lunch tired for those of us from the West, it's like three in the morning or something. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to switch gears here and talk about containers uh, and what we've been doing in IBM uh, around containers. I'm going to talk about kind of uh, our overall strategy and some of the things that we've been delivering uh, for container capability in IBM's cloud portfolio. Phil's going to come up in a minute and, uh, and talk about some of the contributions and work we've been doing in the community, uh, in, in uh, the Docker ecosystem and other places around uh, the container space. Uh, how many of you have heard about containers? That, that's like an easy question, right? Uh, how many of you have actually run a container yourself? Good. All right, so this is like the hot topic that everyone wants to talk about, and I think for very good reason. I think containers are uh, a pretty transformative technology, uh, transformative to how we build apps and transformative to how we run infrastructure. Um, within IBM, as we've been kind of building out our cloud architecture, We've been looking at how uh, different technologies, different open technologies fit together and the role that they play in providing a robust platform for hosting applications in the cloud. Um, and we really have kind of settled on there being three 
um, uh, uh, or actually four fundamental compute models uh, that we think need to be made available in a cloud environment. Um, you have bare metal infrastructure, right? There are use cases where uh, the control and the performance of bare metal makes a ton of sense. Uh, we have virtual machines um, provided by, from an API perspective, by Nova, uh, Nova APIs and OpenStack. Uh, we have containers uh, uh, based on Docker uh, in, in our strategy. Um, and then we have uh, what we call instant runtimes, which is essentially the capability we get out of Cloud Foundry. Uh, think of instant runtimes as containers with a prescriptive programming model. It's an opinionated version of containers uh, where straight Docker containers give you a lot of flexibility on the kinds of applications you can run, um, but instant runtimes uh, give you uh, a quicker way to get started with your code as long as you fit within a certain set of rules about how your applications are built. And so what we've been doing uh, in IBM is bringing together all of these technologies as we build our cloud and working across all of these communities, across OpenStack, across the Docker ecosystem, across the Cloud Foundry Foundation, uh, Linux and other places to bring these technologies together, to integrate them together, um, and to allow them to work seamlessly together. So whether that means using things like Keystone for doing uh, identity and access across all these capabilities, uh, or whether that's the work we're doing with networking around things like Neutron to allow us to have common networking across all of these technologies. Um, we believe the future of cloud is about bringing these open technologies together into a coherent platform. So let's talk then about the container piece in, in particular. And if you looked at IBM's cloud portfolio, um, the kind of highlight capability around containers is a service that we've made available through Bluemix called IBM Containers. Uh, IBM Containers is a containers as a service hosting environment, a place for you to deploy, run, and manage all of your container-based applications. It's built on top of Docker, right? Uses standard Docker images, exposes a Docker API. You can use the standard Docker tools like the Docker CLI to interact with that service. Um, but it's a cloud service and one where containers are a first-class citizen. You don't have to deploy clusters, set up Docker hosts. You can simply come to the cloud with a Docker image and run it and manage it without having to worry about the infrastructure it runs on. That's our job. Um, one of the things that I think is really powerful about what we're doing around containers uh, and something that you see a lot of active discussion in the industry and in, in the uh, open communities about is the life cycle around a container. You know, how do you build them? How do you deploy them? How do you orchestrate multiple containers working together? Uh, how do you scale them? How do you monitor uh, and do problem determination on containers? All of those life cycle problems have to get solved um, when you're running a container-based workload. And so within IBM Containers, um, we've been trying to bring together all of those pieces as well. Um, and so here's a representation of uh, of what that lifecycle might look like. If you kind of think about a container-based application uh, and taking it through um, all of its steps as you build it and run it and maintain and deploy that thing over time. And throughout that lifecycle, there's a number of capabilities that you need uh, besides just the basic container in which you're running your application. So if you start at the beginning, um, the first step in building a container-based app is you need some content to start with, right? You need some uh, Docker images that provide the foundation on which you're building your application. Um, the obvious place to get those images is Docker Hub, right? Which is the kind of central public repository today um, for Docker images. Um, IBM has been doing some work to make IBM software content available as images. So we've made things like uh, Web3 Liberty or our Node.js platform um, or our mobile foundation that you might have heard about in the previous talk available as images on Docker available in places like Docker Hub. The other thing though is your images might actually be things you've built yourself. So you need a, a place to store and manage private images that are relevant for your team or your company. And so we've provided a private registry capability on cloud where you can store and manage all of your images in a, in a non-public location, but a location that's private to you and your team. Um, step two uh, in the lifecycle is building your 
uh, new Docker images, right? So you take some starting point, some base image, uh, you add your application into it, and you now need to build that image. Uh, you can do that, of course, locally on your laptop, right, using Docker Build. Um, but we also provide a cloud-hosted service that does Docker Build for you. So you can actually um, build your image, build your Docker file, and then actually run a remote build where the build will happen in the cloud. Uh, the build resources are managed for you in the cloud, and the resultant image will be pushed automatically into your private registry of Docker images. Step three in the pipeline is delivery. How do you actually now take that application you've built in a container and deliver it into a running system, into running production, into a running test environment? And there's really two capabilities here which I think are, are relevant. The first is uh, uh, build pipeline service. Right? So the ability to actually define a repeatable continuous delivery uh, pipeline that lets you take that application and run it in a structured way through uh, automated build, through testing, uh, from test environments to staging environments to production environments in a controlled way. And so we have a pipeline service that allows you to define a delivery pipeline that works for your team um, and automate the process of delivering that change throughout the steps that you want it to go through to get to production. And that pipeline understands containers, it understands Docker, it knows how to do builds, it knows how to publish to Docker registries, it knows how to talk to uh, a Docker host or to our container service and uh, execute those containers on your behalf. Um, the next step in the pipeline is actually deploying the container into a running container service. Uh, and of course, the heart of that is this uh, service that we've built on Bluemix, uh, the container service that gives us a shared pool of Docker hosts on which we can run your container for you. Um, but there's some other capabilities wrapped around that. Um, we've done a bunch of work around uh, networking, providing isolated private networking for containers. We actually use Neutron as the control plane for that. So all of our Docker images running on the cloud get their own IP address, their own private network. That entire network infrastructure is set up automatically by leveraging Neutron with OVS and other technologies to allow us to set up the networking in infrastructure that you need to run your containers. Um, we've done work around persistent storage for containers. So if you have a need, let's say that you have a Docker image that's running a database and you want to mount a persistent storage for the database information itself, you can do that in an automated way, share that persistent storage across container images, or have that data live beyond the life cycle of the container itself. So if you're going to update your database server, you just want to throw the container away and replace it with a new one and reattach the same data uh, to that container that you had before. Um, we've also done work on things like uh, support for routes. So if you have a container-based app that's handling HTTP uh, uh, traffic, like a, a REST API server, uh, we can manage the routing of that traffic on your behalf, do load balancing across a set of containers, um, and manage fault tolerance of that traffic path so that you have a very simple way to expose a container-based HTTP endpoint. Once the thing is up and running, uh, you need some capabilities to help keep it running. You need uh, clustering or container groups that allow you to scale that application, that allow you to uh, respond to changes in demand, uh, and that allow you to recover in the event of failure. Um, we also are taking advantage of things like bare metal performance. Our containers run on top of bare metal. They don't run on top of a hypervisor. So you have uh, uh, and a more efficient execution path where those containers can run directly on a bare metal server. And then finally, you want some visibility into your container-based system. Um, and so we've done work around integrating logging and monitoring for containers automatically. So any containers you run automatically get log analytics and metrics data. And again, we're doing this within the community. We're leveraging technologies like Elasticsearch and Graphite as the infrastructure for doing that monitoring. And we've integrated it in with with uh, Docker. Uh, we've open sourced technologies like a crawler technology that can automatically extract all the log and metric data from a Docker host from all the containers on that host and publish that information into a logging system. So as a developer, you don't have to um, deal with how do I instrument my container for logging. That can happen automatically just by running that container on a host that's been instrumented to get that data for you. So I just wanted to give you a sense for the kind of the full breadth of capability you need in any container environment if you really want to run production grade workloads within that environment. Um, so have we been doing this alone? And the answer is of course not. Uh, we've been doing this um, uh, with partners and in with the community. Um, IBM has a, a business partnership with Docker the company. Uh, Phil's going to talk in a minute about some of the work we've been doing in the Docker ecosystem uh, from an open source perspective. Um, 
<coughs> but IBM and Docker have uh, a business relationship where we've been working together uh, to uh, deliver containers in an enterprise context. The IBM containers work I just described is, is part of that. Um, but we're also doing work around on-premise uh, uh, support for Docker registries and runtimes uh, and integration with other parts of our portfolio. So Michael Elder uh, spoke uh, before us on some of the work that he's been doing around heat patterns with things like urban code. Uh, we have integration of Docker into those platforms so that as a developer, if you're building applications using Docker, we can uh, integrate that with your existing development processes that you might have built um, with uh, tools like urban code deploy. Um, with the community, there are two important things I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, in the last uh, six months or so, uh, two important foundations have been created to help move the container ecosystem to a more open governance model around the technologies that define containers. Um, and so, so trying to make sure that all of us have the right voice in shaping the future of containers. Um, the first is something called the Open Container Initiative. And the Open Container Initiative, which was created underneath the Linux Foundation, its mission is to define a standard specification and reference runtime for uh, a container runtime and image format. Right? So this is actually defining the standard for what it is, uh, what it means to build a, a container image, and what a container runtime should do, and allows us a standard specification for that so that we can build different implementations of container environments across different platforms right, uh, or across uh, different providers. Um, uh, that was done with a whole bunch of industry players. You can see here uh, the guys at Docker contributed uh, parts of the Docker project like Run C as the initial reference implementation. And that community is actively working right now to clarify its charter and to define the kind of key elements that will make up the basic definition of what a container is and what a container image is. The second foundation is something called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And this was formed uh, a month or so later. Um, again, a huge collection of uh, industry players, uh, including other foundations like the Cloud Foundry Foundation and others uh, that are part of the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. This is a little bit different. The goal of CNCF is to provide a place where we can all collaborate on the higher order problems around containers. You know, how do we do orchestration? How do we do networking? How do we do service discovery or microservices patterns with containers? Uh, its goal is not to come up with a single specification, but to be a place where we can innovate together around maturing the idea of containers and filling out that life cycle that I described, uh, filling out all the capabilities in that life cycle uh, in a community forum. Um, uh, Google uh, uh, contributed things like Kubernetes as part of that uh, foundation. Uh, the Mesos guys are contributing. Uh, IBM is contributing resource management and other technology into that space. Um, so I think this is going to become, over the next year, a really vibrant place where we'll see the development of a lot of important uh, container management technologies, uh, the things that we all need to make that full life cycle I described real. So with that is a little bit of context on what we've been doing around containers. Let me have Phil come up, and he's going to talk about what we've been doing on the open source side. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Is my mic on? All right, yeah. I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Jason's given you kind of a view into what we've been doing with Docker and containers from an enterprise delivery and partnership. Um, but I think it'd be great to, to also step back and, you know, even going back to what uh, Steve and Brad discussed, um, and even if going all the way back to this morning's keynote, when IBM uh, involves ourselves in an open source community, we try and do it in an effective way that's not just beneficial to IBM's interests, but uh, beneficial to the community as a whole. And so Docker is just another uh, instance where we have uh, starting... Uh, a little over a year ago with a single contributor in the upstream community, um, just as we've done with Cloud Foundry and with OpenStack, uh, we've grown that over the past year to approximately uh, 25 different uh, IBM uh, contributors across many of the projects. So uh, a couple of us have become maintainers in the Docker engine, so myself and, and another uh, IBMer that I work closely with. But we're not just working in the engine. You can see the list here. I won't read all of them, but uh, we've contributed to things like Compose and Swarm uh, to the distribution project. 
and some of the other pieces that are now going into these foundations, such as LibContainer, which is now part of the Open Container Initiative. Um, so across that set of releases that you can see there, um, we've now grown our overall contributions to be the number three um, non-Docker Inc. contributor uh, to the upstream project, which is uh, exciting for us. And in that time, we've not only done things that are beneficial overall, but we've also been able to integrate some of the things that enable our container service. So integrations into software and object store, um, and now, uh, in several cases, working on enabling some of our other architectures. You've heard of Power and System Z. So enabling these uh, in the Docker engine, in the registry, and even in Docker's own test workflow to be able to test on other architectures. Um, and so, you know, you've seen that, that much of this work has led into what we've been able to do in our Bluemix container service. But I thought I'd spend just a, a minute to list some of the very specific things that we've done. Uh, that are both beneficial, again, to us, but, but also to the overall community. Um, so in the area of security, running a public cloud uh, obviously has uh, some fairly significant security concerns. We have people at IBM Research uh, looking at all the, the attack surface uh, all across the container ecosystem. And so we've been able to add things like user namespaces, which is something that's uh, coming in Docker 1.9, 1, 1 uh, trying to, to clean up the overall error handling paths, uh, debugging capabilities, um, and several other key enhancements. Um, and of course, we have many other things that, that we'd like to see happen in the future that we continue to work on. I just mentioned that uh, multi-architecture support is key for us across all our platforms, but it also enables things like ARM and the Raspberry Pi work that's happening uh, in the Docker community. Things around internationalization, which is obviously of interest uh, around the world. And then we continue to work in the uh, Run C community. So for the Open Container Initiative, there's a set of work to continue moving the specification forward and the implementation of Run C, uh, and even looking forward to uh, Docker's REST API using Swagger uh, to formalize that. So these are all areas where uh, we are contributing or looking forward to do in the future. Uh, and you can see a timeline there of, of both our, our business partnership, but also our, our open source work uh, with Docker and the, the rest of the community members. One, again, I just mentioned a, a moment ago that uh, running a public cloud uh, with Docker containers has, has caused us to look uh, deeply in the area of security. And so this has been a great way for us to partner with Docker both upstream in the open source community, but also to have uh, calls together with them on things that we're finding, research that we're doing. And so a, a few areas where we've worked together, we've submitted pull requests, we've, we've had things merged uh, related to app armor profiles, uh, our work on multi-tenancy. So obviously we're running a multi-tenant container service. Uh, those of you who know uh, the Docker engine today doesn't have multi-tenancy, so working on uh, some of those specifications. So Docker is now looking to add an authorization and authentication capabilities. I mentioned user namespaces and uh, limitations on a container wanting to go wild and, and open uh, millions of files or try and, and bring the system down with fork bombs. So these are all areas where we're working with Docker and with the community. If you would like to hear more on that, uh, one, of the, one of our IBM security researchers is here this week and we'll be talking tomorrow on, on a lot of those uh, lessons of running a production cloud and work that we're doing there. So uh, this is a bit of a shift. I, I think that's um, hopefully given you a good flavor of, of what we're doing uh, with containers, both in our enterprise delivery of them through Bluemix and the open source work. But to, to jump back to Brad and Steve, we have book authors here. They're not only Keystone uh, experts in the community, but they've written a book. I don't know if you, uh, you receive one on the way in, but there are books available, uh, a free, free copy for you to take uh, that uh, has already received great feedback, just useful information. And then myself and another one of the Docker uh, maintainers has written a book called Open by Design. A research report that's available in ebook form. 
And so as you're leaving the table that's directly outside the door, there are postcards with the download link for that book if you'd like to receive that. That's looking at, at really the strategy that we've talked about uh, just in the last little bit here about our focus on open source and open governor, governance as the way to transform uh, cloud technology. So that's available as a free download uh, as well. And then Jason was involved in uh, the New Stack's recent publication of the Docker and Container Ecosystem. Uh, you can download that from the New Stack directly, and so that's available as well. And then in this room, uh, through the remainder of the day, there are still talks uh, available um, on, on various topics that may be of interest to you. And with that, I think uh, we have completed our material. So thank you for coming.